The next speaker, Carlos Schwantes, has actually been a hero of mine since his book, Railroad Signatures Across the Pacific Northwest, hit the market in 1993. And at the time, he was director of the Institute of Pacific Northwest Studies and a professor of history at the University of Idaho. Railroad Signatures was not only an interesting read, but it was full of colorful ephemera, artfully used to illustrate his story and to, lead su and to lend substance to his text. No longer was academic history 400 pages of boring text with no pictures. Carlos Schwantes had defied the long-standing academic traditions and instead created a scholarly volume that was embraced by the lay public who could actually understand what he wrote and were introducing thousands of people to graphically interesting 19th and early 20th century ephemera relating to transportation and railroads. For many of us, Carlos Schwantes did for ephemera what Ken Burns and his Civil War did for historical photography, manuscript letters, and diaries. And like Burns, Schwantes continued to produce book after book, heavily using ephemera to illustrate his premises. Two of his other books, Long Day's Journey, The Steamboat and Stagecoach Era in the Northern West, and The West the Railroads Made, are especially rich in the use of ephemera. Carlos Schwantes obtained his PhD in history from the University of Michigan. He taught at Walla Walla University in the state of Washington for 15 years before, the, before joining the staff at the University of Idaho. In 2001, he relocated to the Midwest to become the St. Louis Mercantile Library Endowed Professor of Transportation Studies in the West at the University of Missouri, St. Louis a position that he still holds. He has been the author or editor of 20 books and dozens of professional journal articles. He has received numerous awards and honors, including the Western History Association's Joan Patterson Kerr Award in 2001 for the best illustrated book on the American West, illustrated in large part with ephemera. He has also served as a consultant to many historical projects, conducted seminars, served on editorial boards, and in short, has had a long, illustrative and productive career in the field of history. There are two other things you need to know about Carlos. For years, he has used ephemera as educational tools in his college classes and in graduate seminars. His students in history become astutely aware of the potential value of ephemera as rich historical documents as they pursue their own academic studies. And secondly, Carlos not only effectively uses ephemera, he is a collector of ephemera. His interest in the multi-million dollar industry of travel and transportation has led him to develop what is now a major collection of tens of thousands of brochures, pamphlets, maps, and guidebooks from the 1830s to the present devoted to the topic. Besides searching through dealer's inventory and searching on eBay, Carlos has ex traveled extensively all over the world, picking up ephemera at every airport, train depot, bus station, hotel literature rack, and newsstand he encounters, often returning from his trips with literally pounds and pounds of paper ephemera. What a guy. <laughs> Carlos Schwantes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Thank you, Glenn. I had an epiphany as I was listening to that introduction. I never realized I was a rebel uh, until I heard, heard Glenn say that I broke the mold in terms of uh, some of these heavyweight historical tomes uh, using lots and lots of ephemera. It was not easy because I had uh, several colleagues who did not appreciate the use of ephemera. I remember one who saw my book, uh, Railroad Signatures, he said, oh, I see you've done another picture book <laughs> or another coffee table book, you know, anything to make it of less importance. But uh, 
I was thinking as, as Glenn was giving that nice introduction that at the age of 12, my father was a revolutionary in Brazil. So maybe I'm in part of the tradition in a different, in a different way. But in any case, this is my maiden voyage for the Ephemera Society of America. Someone asked me earlier if I was a member, and I say, absolutely, I'm proud to be a member. And it's also my maiden voyage to discuss a collection of ephemera that actually goes back uh, to 1957, the summer of 1957, when I was 12 years old. And for want of something better to do, I started writing all the railroad companies in the United States and asking for their timetables. And I started arraying them out on the front porch, uh, abrading the covers, of course. I didn't know anything about ephemera. I never heard the word. But uh, I was just interested in the subject and then put them away for years and then brought them out and got interested in expanding uh, the collection greatly. And so today's presentation is based on the, the collection I've put together plus images I've been able to pull off the internet to use to illustrate certain points that I've not yet found actual ephemera for. A little background, a few years ago, the University of Missouri in St. Louis, where I currently teach, uh, tried to encourage more online teaching. They thought it was cost effective. And so they paid faculty members a bonus of $3,000 to go take a workshop called Online and Nine. It was nine, nine sessions. And I did that. And I realized if I was going to convert my, my repertoire of classes to online, I needed to illustrate them. Nothing is more boring than to teach a class with nothing but, but text, just words, as important as the words are. And so I rediscovered at that point the eye-catching appeal of ephemera, brought out those old timetables that somehow I'd managed to keep through several moves, and uh, discovered that more and more were available on the internet uh, through eBay. And so I used uh, the internet, particularly eBay, uh, to uh, uh, augment my collection. The ap appeal of ephemera to college students is amazing, and some of the uh, ephemera available in image form on the internet just blows me away. And so I use some of this very controversial ephemera to generate student discussions. We have what are called online discussion forums where everybody contributes. And sometimes you get the sense that the students are asleep. You got to somehow get them motivated. And this is a, a French advertisement for Rouge that's based on uh, radium. And uh, I just had never seen such a thing, but of course it puts a glow in the cheeks of these uh, beautiful young ladies. Or this one, which has a special appeal for my students in St. Louis, a piece of sheet music some of you may have seen called Under the Anheuser Busch. Uh, I don't know if it has any connection with the actual Anheuser Busch family. They didn't actually spell Anheuser uh, right. But, um, come on. <laughs> Am I? There we go. Let's go back now to Pearl Harbor, uh, the beginning of the Second World War. We've had several presentations that deal uh, with uh, the war, and uh, my presentation effectively begins with the sneak attack on December 7th, 1941, that Roosevelt called a day that will live in infamy. And if you still have a memory, even though I wasn't born yet, it was part of my parents' uh, memory, uh, very much so. This, these images I found on the internet. Someone asked me once, can you use those images? You can in a public presentation. You can't in a book or a, or a CD or something like that. They don't belong to me. But the ones that I own uh, that are out of copyright, I'm definitely going to use. Well, America was furious. And the idea of avenging Pearl Harbor uh, 
was on everybody's lips. Um, and a number of posters were created uh, to avenge Pearl Harbor. Here's another one. Uncle Sam there shaking his fist at the Japanese zeros. This gave rise, of course, to some great wartime ephemera images. Uh, this is uh, the Japanese snake. Uh, the Japanese were often portrayed in non-human ways. Some people say, well, this was a, a reflection of American racism. I think it could equally be a reflection of American anger at being sneak attacked because uh, this was just beyond the pale of, of the way nations did things and so America responded. And here's another poster. Uh, the Japanese were never called Japanese. They were always Japs uh, during the uh, Second World War. I just found and purchased this piece of ephemera. ephemera. You'll never guess where it came from. Greyhound Bus Company published its own magazine long before the airlines started publishing their magazines. It was called The Highway Traveler. And I saw this one uh, for the summer of 42. And uh, it's about as evocative with this fellow pointing a gun straight at you as any of the transportation related uh, ephemera of the era. Here's another one with Popeye the Sailor. Again, I, this is from the internet. Um, I'd love to have that myself. But notice that, he that the words here are conflated. They're Japan Nazis. And uh, many of these posters really tug at your heartstrings. Um, the artists themselves were uh, captured on film by somebody. I don't know uh, who took this picture, but this is a group of young ladies, uh, presumably in Washington, D.C., who are designing the posters uh, that Uncle Sam used in uh, uh, World War II. It looks to me like they must have had a master design up there because they're all designing the same um, poster that would go out, uh, all designed by hand. And yes, this is Dr. Seuss uh, of the uh, green ham and, and eggs and so forth. Dr. Seuss was very much involved uh, in uh, wartime propaganda posters and uh, after the war began to design the little children's books which I read to all my children and I realized there, there are multiple levels of meanings in the Dr. Seuss books and uh, when I ran across this I said aha I understand now that Dr. Seuss wrote on several levels. Well this was a, a favorite whipping boy of the poster makers of World War II. It was called the Tokyo Kid. You can see his face here. He's kind of subhuman, but there's a whole genre of, of uh, Tokyo kid thanking American workers for loafing on the job, for uh, cheating on their gasoline rationing and so forth. And uh, I would love to know more about the background to who came up with the Tokyo uh, kid uh, posters. Here's another uh, poster about uh, forest fires. And again, Hitler is portrayed more or less as Hitler, but the Japanese uh, fellow is portrayed as, as much more evil and sinister uh, looking character. And I suspect this is where the historians get the idea that unlike our dealing with Germany, in our dealing with Japan, we were motivated more by racism, and that's why we dropped the atomic bomb uh, twice on Japan. Uh, you know, who's to say? Well, the railroads used their public timetables and other ephemera to express their own uh, brand of patriotism. I might say that there are two types of railroad timetables. There are the public timetables that were designed to be put on literature racks in, in railway stations and hotels and so forth for the public to use. And these are what I collect because there are images and messages in there that the railroads are trying to get across to the American people. There's another type of timetable that has almost no illustrations in it. It's called employees' timetables. And it deals with the nitty-gritty of actually running 
the railroad, the, the passenger trains and so forth. And there, that genre, I have a few examples of it, but I don't actively collect it because I'm more interested in the public message that the railroads have been putting out for well over 100 years. Uh, this is put out by the Erie Railroad. This was to help uh, travelers identify who was who in the armed forces. Uh, if you're riding on a, a passenger train and you see somebody in particular uniform, well, this gives you some sense of who they might be, what service, what branch of the service. And it does feature women. We heard earlier about uh, women in the First World War. Here's another one put out by the mighty Pennsylvania Railroad. The Pennsylvania Railroad at the time was the largest railroad in the world. And it, it bragged that it was the standard railroad of the world. So it reached more people uh, than any other railroad. And this was designed to say, here are the people that are needing our trains. Consider not riding the train for a while. Here's another variation where they take basically the same image. This is the cover of a public timetable that the Pennsylvania Railroad issued in 1943. By the way, 1943, the railroad saw greater ridership than ever before, ever since. If you look at the statistics, there's a huge spike for 1943 because of the number of troops uh, being moved around the country. Here's a spirit of 43, Uncle Sam rolling up his sleeve. That's again, it's Pennsylvania Railroad, which happened to go through the industrial heart of America between uh, Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. It went through Johnstown and Altoona and, and a number of the uh, heavy industry areas of the United States. Here's uh, one where they're actually recruiting uh, war workers uh, for the railroads. So many had been drafted that they were short-handed of the war workers, and so they were looking for people uh, wanting to come and work for the railroads. This is a very interesting one that actually appeared in the in inner cover of a railroad timetable, and this is uh, Dad over there running the steam locomotive and Son, who is guarding one of the troop trains that's passing Dad. So the idea of this being a family affair, you know, and this tugging on your heartstrings to cooperate with the railroads, who are, which are overburdened, overloaded, uh, because they're doing their best, uh, is very important. Here's one for the Norfolk and Western with Uncle Sam. Avoid industrial accidents, and they're putting out their best locomotives as their their contribution uh, to the, the Second World War. The Boston and Maine uh, simply used its timetable to urge you to buy bonds. You can't miss the message. It's everywhere on the timetable. This is another Boston and Maine uh, brochure which is urging you not to ride the railroads. This seems strange. Uh, the railroads had been asking for passengers all through the Great Depression, the 1930s. They, were, they had capacity beyond ability to fill it. Suddenly, it goes the opposite way, and they're saying, uh, this poor soldier, or this poor sailor, actually it says Coast Guard, is hardly as snug as a bug in a rug because he can't get Pullman space, sleeping car space. So he has to sleep sitting up. That's not a good way to go to war. Here's another one, again, that tugs on your heartstring. This is from the inside uh, cover of a Louisville and Nashville railroad uh, poster. Again, buy war bonds. Goodbye, my son. God bless you. Um, and here's the boy left behind because somebody was taking the train um, without being respectful of the military. And so this fellow um, can't get on the train. There's a, there's a total truth in all of this. My mother, my late mother, um, traveled by train in 43 to visit my father. They were newlyweds and he was 
in training at Camp Grant, Illinois, and she uh, came to the train and Cincinnati Union Station and it started to pull out. And they had a Dutch door and they'd already closed the Dutch door and one of the strong soldiers saw her predicament and in 43, as you know, women's garments had broad shoulders built into them. He just picked her up like this and pulled her over the top of the Dutch door. So she wasn't left behind, but she said once she was on the car, uh, there was no space. People were in the overhead racks. People were sitting on suitcases. Um, it was just impossible uh, to do anything but stand up. And she said this particular car must have been stored uh, for weeks in the um, uh, coach yard in Cincinnati because she said when it heated up, uh, the soot came down off the ceiling and they all looked like they were in blackface because the soot had come down all over their uniforms, all over her nice dress and, and so forth. So it was not a pleasant way to travel. Let's see. And here is a, again, an example of one of the posters. Me travel, not this summer, vacation at home. This is the Office of Defense Transportation. So every, <clears throat> if you were a civilian and you were trying to travel by train during the Second World War, it was a very bad experience. Uh, they tried to discourage you, but if you were stubborn and went anyway, you found old equipment, no space. One of my colleagues at the University of Idaho uh, who preceded me was a, a World War II veteran, and he said he was on a train as a soldier, a uh, lieutenant, I believe, going between Los Angeles and San Francisco on the Southern Pacific. And you were only served two meals a day to conserve food. And so he uh, was at breakfast. And one older gentleman asked for a second cup of coffee. Not only were you only served two meals, but you're only allowed one cup of coffee. And the waiter snapped. He said, sir, don't you know there's a war on? And the old man said, I do know there's a war on. I've lost two sons in this war. And the waiter disappeared, didn't say a word. And about five minutes later, he came back with a full coffee uh, carafe and set it down in front of him and walked off. So <laughs> that was the atmosphere at the time. Why, what's the motivation behind this? You could say, well, the railroads just wanted to be patriotic. <clears throat> but there's a, another layer. They wanted to prevent a federal takeover of the railroads. You say, well, what is that all about? Well, in the memory of the railroads, 20 years earlier, the federal government had taken them over during the First World War. This is a military map from World War I. I teach a class, by the way, at the University of Missouri called the Great 20th Century War, in which the First World War, the Second World War, the rise of the Soviet Union, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, are all part of the great 20th century war because they're all interconnected. There would be no Soviet Union if it hadn't been for the First World War, I'm convinced. Um, the Versailles Treaty contained the seeds that Hitler was used to sprout the, the Nazi party uh, in Germany and so forth. And so this is the, going back to the First World War, which was ever in everybody's minds that was alive at that time. And so the one thing the railroads w desperately wanted to prevent was federal takeover. Here's a cartoon from the First World War where Uncle Sam's driving the locomotive. I don't know the symbolism of the little bear there uh, at the brake wheel. Uh, I think that was the cartoonist's own little, little uh, internal uh, gig. And so the United States Railroad Administration was created in late 1917. The United States went to war in April 1917. That's when Congress uh, declared war under the uh, Wilson administration. And the problem that occurred is that the East Coast ports like Baltimore, Boston, and so forth were jammed with railroad cars with supplies and they couldn't get out. They had in other words, a railroad gridlock. Some historians argue that this was a result of misguided federal policies 
of the progressive period that uh, during the progressive period they passed legislation that made the railroads uninviting investment prospects. They weren't allowed to earn enough return on investment that they could buy new cars, that they could buy, that they could modernize their yards. And so in a sense, Uncle Sam is taking over what he's ruined, uh, according to one school of thought, uh, in the previous uh, progressive era. Now, I, I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. I was told all the great things the progressive era did, and none of the downside. I never knew there was a downside until I got out of graduate school and started reading. Child labor, everybody's uh, in favor of abolishing child labor, which the progressives did, but nobody thought of the unintended consequences, which was many an immigrant family depended on all of the money being pooled, and when their children weren't allowed to work by law, they had to, to farm them out for adoption. They could not support. So the breakup of the family was one of the negative consequences of the so-called progressive era. And the other was the uh, degradation of the railroad plant. During the federal takeover, the timetables were all reduced to a government standard. They all looked alike. I got interested in collecting these things off eBay, and they don't come up very often. But when they do, uh, I've picked them up. Uh, as part of a sub-collection dealing with the United States Railroad Administration. And the thing that caught my attention is how drab they are. There's no illustrations. It's like we've abolished uh, all those illustrations that the railroads used to use. Here's a, here's a, a blown up example from the Pennsylvania Railroad. They always have the United States Railroad Administration and avoid waste, keep this timetable, which you know, goes, uh, uh, I suppose, would be nice for ephemera collectors if more people collect, uh, kept those timetables. Here is what was before that and why I draw the contrast. Before the First World War, you had incredible uh, examples of lithography, of, of um, typography. Uh, this uh, particular type of type, I took a class in letterpress printing eons ago. The circus uh, type of printing was very common on the railroad timetables uh, prior to the First World War. Uh, here's another one uh, for a railroad that ran in uh, Canada and the United States between Skagway and uh, Whitehorse in the Yukon. Very colorful images. Uh, the, the USRA did produce a few colorful booklets, not timetables, but some promotional booklets. These are promotional booklets issued as kind of a, a, a cognitive dissonance. Here they are uh, telling people to vacation in Zion National Park or in Hot Springs National Park and yet the war is going on and the people are supposed to, to pull in their belts and save and so forth, but you know, the, probably there's some politics involved here that I haven't quite figured out yet. Maybe the senator from Arkansas was uh, a big uh, uh, booster in the Wilson administration, so they said we better issue one for the hot springs. But before the war, Again, you had all of these colorful uh, brochures. The Northern Pacific, in particular, uh, spent an enormous amount of effort to uh, promote its area. And the reason for that is that when it was completed across the northern tier states in 1883, it had the largest land grant in American history. That was land given to the railroad to support its building uh, to develop, quote, undeveloped parts of the United States. And so Congress gave more land to this railroad than to any other railroad. And you may say, how much land? It was equal to multiples. I've never quite figured out how many multiples, but two or three times the size of all the New England states put together, which is appropriate here in Connecticut to think about. <laughs> 
one railroad getting uh, this whole New England area multiplied by several times. And so to sell their land to tourists, to settlers, they had an enormous uh, publishing program. Here's another one. This was a publishing program supported by what we could call the Harriman Railroads. Uh, Edward Harriman, E.H. Harriman, uh, owned the Southern Pacific, the Union Pacific, and the Illinois Central at one time, before the federal government broke them up. And this campaign alone uh, was designed to cause people to settle in the un uh, populated or low populated areas served by the Harriman lines on the west coast. And so this is an example from the uh, Pocatello, Idaho. And there are hundreds of these. I try to collect them, but they're very expensive. <clears throat> I did some research when I included some of them in my book that uh, Glenn alluded to on the railroads of the northwest. It turns out the manager of the whole program was the first classics graduate of Stanford University. You look at some of these motifs and you can see a classicist at work. Here's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, this was uh, a brochure not promoting settlement, not promoting tourism, but promoting milk in Wisconsin, long before Wisconsin uh, became known as the dairy state, the Chicago and Northwestern is promoting its milk production. And uh, when I was getting into collecting railroad ephemera, I didn't always appreciate the value of the non-timetables. And one of uh, a mutual friend uh, between Glenn and me, a fellow uh, named Ed Nolan, who's a wonderful ephemera collector, said, Here's one, you gotta have it. He sent me an email. I don't remember how much it cost, a couple hundred, but it was just wonderful that he could educate me on expanding out my interest in railroad ephemera. Well, these are some of the images. This is only a tiny sampling. Uh, this is a front cover of a Gulf Mobile in Ohio. Here you see the troops eating uh, in the dining car, here you see them getting ready uh, to board the train. Uh, I continue to look for World War II era timetables because they have such wonderful patriotic messages in them uh, and uh, nobody has risen to bid the price up much. So they're uh, <laughs> one of those great collectibles that you can get for $8, $10, $15, and uh, make a whole collection of, of the public statement of patriotism by the railroads of the United States. So I'm gonna end there and see <laughs> if you have any questions that uh, I can answer for you. <laughs> any questions? Yes, sir. I don't know if it's a question that might be just a uh, red herring, but with Uncle Sam as the engineer and that train with the teddy bear on the coal car, it occurs to me that Uncle Sam Wilson might come to someone's mind when they were designing that, and I don't know, perhaps the teddy bear was in some reference to an earlier administration. <laughs> the t uh, yeah, Theodore Roosevelt and the teddy bear, yeah. yeah. You know, that, that's what makes ephemera fascinating. I don't have all the answers and you can scratch and scratch and scratch. And uh, one of the things I never really thought about till I was sitting in this meeting today is, who's doing the publishing? The Poole Brothers, the uh, Rand McNally. Uh, whatever happened to some of these publishing companies and where did they get their, their graphic expertise? Um, this is a whole other area that I think I need to go <laughs> back now and start uh, doing some serious research on. So, yes, ma'am. Can you tell us about the, the future of a transportation uh, center in St. Louis? <clears throat> now I know Suleen. <laughs> it's been about 30 years since we've seen one another. Um, <clears throat> 
Where I work uh, is like a Russian nesting doll. It's I'm the St. Louis Mercantile Library professor, which is within the library system at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And the Mercantile Library is the oldest library west of the Mississippi River in continuous operation. It's barely west, but nonetheless, uh, it used to be in downtown St. Louis, and they moved it out to the campus, which is close to the airport. And over the years, it has accumulated what is probably the largest holding of railroad materials in the world. People don't know it. Uh, that's one of my jobs, is to try to promote it. And my own collection I intend to give to the library uh, when I pass away. They called me the other day and said, oh, we're coming out in April and we'll get your collection. I said, wait a minute, I'm not dead. I want to enjoy this collection. I want to arrange it. I want to create more presentations like this. So um, I, I'm working with them, but it's a great center. If any of you are in St. Louis, it's very close to the airport. It's called the Mercantile Library. The Barriger collection is the railroad collection, but I recruited another collection that's in the process of being moved to St. Louis from Sarasota, Florida, uh, that was put together by the former president of the Rock Island Railroad. He was an interesting fellow, Bill Dixon, in that he was at the top of the railroad industry, but he also loved the industry. He was one of those people that we talked, that we heard earlier, who had the passion and he collected this stuff, but he had a big fight, a railroad fight, with the uh, railroad headed by Mr. Berger, whose collection it has the name. He said, I'll give it to you, but you can't put it in his collection. You gotta put it in my collection. So, I mean, even in that after death experience, the, the two guys are, are separated, but there's wonderful uh, railroad material there and uh, it also has a huge collection of maritime material, particularly inland waterways. And then the uh, former president of the, or chancellor of the university was on the board of directors of TWA. And when it was folded into American Airlines, all the corporate records went to the Mercantile Library. And so it got planes, trains, and some automobiles. So uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous place. Uh, and I teach a class called The Railroad in American Life and another one called The Automobile in American Life and then one of my doctoral students from Michigan, uh, from uh, Idaho teaches one called The Aviation, Aviation in American Life. So we've got all this wonderful raw material, we call them, historians call it primary sources for students to use for term papers and master's theses and so forth. So. Um, that's, <clears throat> that's one way of looking at St. Louis as a hub for collecting uh, transportation materials, but it was always a kind of transportation hub, even in the days of steamboat transportation. Does it include maps? All kinds of maps. The director of the library loves maps, and so he uh, is always acquiring uh, maps. But it's called the St. Louis Mercantile Library, and it's on the campus of the University of Missouri at St. Louis, which is, I mean, we're so close to the airport, we can hear these planes coming over, and actually, one uh, plane year before I got there crashed on the campus, an Ozark plane in a thunderstorm. So, I mean, that's how close we are uh, to the Lambert Field in St. Louis. I just wanted to John Hoover. John so Hoover. He is absolutely so passionate about Oh, material. he loves, he loves ephemera. He's got his own collection of agricultural ephemera, the pamphlets and so forth. Uh, it's a wonderful place because 
with the railroad library, Mr. Berger collected all kinds of railroad ephemera, and then um, other collections are there. Uh, one person collected uh, steamboat ephemera, which, I, which is very hard to find because it's an earlier era, and uh, anytime I see it on eBay, somebody bids it way past my budget. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, I haven't been in the courthouse lately, but, <coughs> excuse me, St. Louis uh, is a wonderful uh, base for research because you not only have the Mercantile Library, but the Missouri Historical Society, which covers the West, because at one time St. Louis was the furthest West. I remember reading a piece of ephemera that was a proclamation by the governor of Pennsylvania. And he was saying Pennsylvania needs to support railroads as far west as St. Louis. You know, that was the end of the, the, the known world in some respects. Yeah, it's it. They're, they're working on the, the museum under the arch because it told the story basically as a triumphal narrative. Now they're trying to bring in Native Americans and others into the narrative that they will uh, have there. Um, so I haven't been personally uh, involved, but I know that it's an ongoing uh, process. Um, but St. Louis itself is a, is a wonderful place for, uh, as I say, these archives. Uh, uh, whether you're talking about Lewis and Clark, there's tons of Lewis and Clark material, or Charles Lindbergh, uh, who flew the Spirit of St. Louis and was supported by Listerine money. Uh, Lambert was the head of the Warner Pharmaceutical, Warner Lambert. and. Uh, in fact, I went to an exhibit that the Missouri Historical Society put on, and one of the objects that Lindbergh carried from New York to Paris, and, I, and it brought to mind an earlier speaker, was a, a pack of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. <laughs> so I think he measured everything in ounces and figured he could slip a pack of Wrigley's to keep awake, maybe, uh, during the long hours of the night. I loved your, the Northern Pacific beautiful illustrations. And I really think that at the same time, the Canadian Pacific also had beautiful, beautiful uh, ads. And they, and they had different artists who were actually competitive with one another. So that's another field you have. Where all the, the artists uh, who were I have uh, two file cabinets full of Canadian Railroad uh, ephemera. Again, I'm, uh, I know my time is up. I want to make one last thing. When I was a young historian, I had to travel all over creation to find material. And sometimes I could barely afford a $10 motel. Uh, and so what I've tried to do in St. Louis is bring in transportation and travel ephemera in one central location where scholars, you people, whether you're scholars or our gifted amateurs can come and stay and get this material. So uh, French railroad material is dirt cheap. Nobody seems to be collecting it. So I've filled a file drawer that you otherwise would have to go to Paris to, to use if you wanted to uh, 
learn. And I've also got two five doors of Greyhound bus material. You saw one. People don't think of the bus industry as very exciting as having put out any nice ephemera, but uh, back in the 30s, the uh, Greyhound was competing actively uh, with the railroads and so put out some very attractive brochures. And nobody seems to collect them, so once again, they're $5, $6, $8, and so forth. So um, that's all going to St. Louis. Yeah. <laughs>